just make sure the recording is on. This is my first recorded Zoom call, so hi, YouTube, or whoever's watching this. So this is going to be fun. Uh, share my screen, and then we should be good to go. Uh, thumbs up if you can see my slides. Awesome. So I'm just getting the chat open just in case you know, no one wants to chime in there. Uh, but yeah, so welcome. Um, this talk is named From Legacy to Vue.js. Uh, it's gone, <laughs> let's, well, let's, let's walk through it. Uh, I'm Dennis, I'm the front end engineering manager for managing growth and I've been at GitLab since March, as you can probably indicate from my contribution graph. And uh, I'm here to talk to you about the next JavaScript framework at GitLab. No, I'm just kidding. We're gonna talk about Vue and how we apply Vue in the context of manage. And I originally wanted to name this, our journey of how we are moving from Rails Automagic JavaScript to Vue.js, the feature costs involved, the technical debt along the way, and how to stay sane while developing the front end at GitLab while st still delivering on the second, 22nd of every month, sorry. But the title doesn't, as you can tell, really flow. And uh, Liam actually suggested that the title be how we do Vue.js long before I even put this presentation together but it actually kind of evolved back into that title because really what we're gonna talk about is how the managed team uses Vue.js and uh, kind of the challenges we encounter uh, developing on the front end as well as kind of some workflow uh, improvements we've made to kind of make that a little bit of an easier process. Um, this is not your typical managed 201. Um, this won't really be covering any specific feature, but just front end in the context of manage at GitLab. Um, it's a little bit of a kind of end of year retrospective for the team as well as in addition to it being a little bit of my experience, uh, a summary of my experience at GitLab. Um, and hopefully uh, any audience will find this somewhat useful. I think for front ends, especially onboarding front enders, um, there will be a lot of tips and things that we kind of discovered that I wish I could kind of known a little bit uh, earlier when I started. Um, that is not always uh, so documented, and um, but also be useful for project product managers, UXers, and pretty much anyone inside or outside of GitLab uh, into getting some insight on what's involved with developing the GitLab front end, as well as understanding why some front end changes, while they may seem simple, can be a little bit more difficult to execute on. Um, there's really no code that we're gonna be going over other than some contextual uh, uh, illustrations to, to highlight some of the history of front-end at GitLab, but we can definitely dive deeper in a later 202 or so on session if we want to take a deeper look at things. Um, on that point, we do have a lot of good talks by Philippa, Phil, Fatih, Tim, Lucas on how we use Vue and Vuex specifically in diving into code. So if you're interested in those, uh, please ping me and I can send over some links, um, but they're also available on YouTube. Um, for those of you joining on the recording or some, uh, if anything I've been saying so far hasn't made any sense, uh, if you would like a 101 or a 102 on Vue.js at GitLab, uh, I've added a couple links here, uh, some really great presentations by Jacob, Tim, and Lucas on how we do Vue.js at GitLab and a little bit more of a look at our, our front end uh, architecture. So. Jumping into it, our agenda for today is we're going to go over a brief history of front-end at GitLab, feature costs, how to identify them with some examples as well, uh, estimating front-end work, some of the challenges we've had, some of the uh, improvements we've made to try to break things down in terms of deliverable scope, uh, what's next for managed front-end, and uh, maybe get into some questions. Um, please feel free to jump in at any point in time if you have a question. I'm happy to chat and it would be awesome to have this more of a conversation. And uh, for the front enders that are on the call, feel free to jump in, uh, add some context, or maybe correct me any errors I may have made. Um, so, jumping into it, a brief history on GitLab at, oh, sorry, a brief history on front end at GitLab. Where do we come from? Where are we going? Um, so for those that aren't familiar, uh, GitLab was built uh, with Ruby on Rails, which came included with CopyScript and jQuery. And so CopyScript solved a lot of issues with ECMAScript 4 and 5, where uh, ECMAScript really wasn't pulling its weight. Uh, and so it really just was there the right tool at the right time. 
But since the introduction of ECMAScript 2015 and 2016 and so on, uh, I think they're now just known as the yearly versions or ES6 or ES7. But modern JavaScript has really made a lot of improvements along the way, which has led us to, uh, allowed us really to move away from CoffeeScript. But there's a little bit more involved with, uh, in addition to CoffeeScript, where we have inline JavaScript, where it served its purpose for small interactive features, but can be very, very difficult to manage when you have a more complex uh, application or some interactivity that needs to happen on the same page. Um, that's not to say that uh, we don't need inline JavaScript from time to time. We'll dive a little bit more into that. But um, it, you can immediately see when you have this JavaScript next to a giant page template, how this can be quite difficult to manage once you get into more, uh, uh, single page applications with handling a lot of state. Um, and as part of our migration from uh, CoffeeScript, um, we ran, uh, we just completely compiled everything from CoffeeScript to uh, ECMAScript 5. Since when you actually run CoffeeScript, that's what it tra uh, transpiles down to. So uh, we just had a mix of jQuery and JavaScript. Uh, in ECMAScript 5. So the thing, the nice thing was that there was a clean migration. And there's no broken tests because literally functionally nothing has changed. And then we wanted to move to the next step, which is just moving to plain JavaScript, vanilla JavaScript, uh, and manually writing uh, ECMAScript 5 to ECMAScript 6 on a as-needed basis. So we still use jQuery, uh, you know, currently. And actually, before we wanted to move to Vue.js, we wanted to consider using, continuing to use jQuery because it handled things like collections nicely um, when ECMAScript 6 was still kind of getting more features added to it. And, um, but ultimately, we decided to move to Vue, which is kind of where we want to move all of our front-end features to uh, and be able to encapsulate all of our components and applications into these composable single file uh, components where we can have all of the wiring, all of the data going in, and all of the templating for a given component application um, more clearly organized in a more component structure. Um, additionally, we have another, um, actually, so just to recap, um, CoffeeScript is gone. Inline JavaScript is mostly gone. We still have some cases where we still need that. Um, but all of our code exists as jQuery, ECMAScript 6, or Vue. Now, there are still areas of our code base that are a mix of Haml and jQuery, uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. We like Haml. Um, it's kind of the intersection of the front end and back end where a lot of the back end data that we need right now is fed through as Haml um, or HTML attributes uh, that get fed into our JavaScript and Vue applications. Now, um, we do want to get rid of jQuery, but there are some strings attached to that. We do have some downstream dependencies, such as select two, and I believe Bootstrap still relies on jQuery that we need to, or at least the flavor of, of Bootstrap does, um, that we need to kind of take care of before we really get rid of jQuery and just completely rely on uh, plain JavaScript as well as Vue. But the main goal is that uh, we're moving to, or the main idea really is that we're moving to Vue.js, but uh, we need to be pragmatic about it. And we'll kind of dig into a little bit later what that means. But as far as the history of front end at GitLab, are there any questions? And unfortunately, my emojis aren't showing up in my slides. Cool, well, let's move on. So this is getting more into the workflow thing. Um, I want to talk about feature costs and how to spot them. But first, what are feature costs? Um, they are things that can cause, they, they can add to an issue's weight and influence our ability to deliver on them. So what do I mean? This is actually one of my deliverables uh, that was merged into 11.6 but you can see these red little labels here, missed deliverable and the missed milestone tags. And so feature costs are things that can influence uh, and, and cause you to miss your deliverables. So it's more specifically, it can be things like technical debt, um, cross team dependencies, uh, unfor unforeseen requirements, things that we may not have discovered until halfway through the issue. Um, and maybe a disparity between how our open source edition works versus our source available edition works and uh, maybe unaccounted features that 
that may exist in EE that we haven't accounted for when we were working on it in CE. So earlier I said, we're moving to Vue.js, but we need to be more pragmatic about it. So what does that actually mean? Um, so we always want to scope things as a minimum viable change. Uh, so there, moving to Vue.js is very important, but we have to make sure that we're not refactoring for the sake of refactoring. And choosing to refactor uh, can really add to our ability to be able to deliver on a feature. And we want to get there, but we have to also continue to deliver value and deliver features uh, to it to our users. So the main goal here is that we know we want to get to Vue.js, um, but it may not be possible to get to Vue.js in one iteration. But if we can get one step closer or one iteration closer, then I think that's a, a, something to keep in mind when we approach our deliverables. And so that's why it's always important to scope things as a minimum viable change. Um, so some strategies when we're evaluating deliverables can, uh, I have some here and hopefully it's a little bit easy to read. It's kind of cause and effect. So looking at something and thinking back to our layers of, of, of JavaScript and front end, if we are just doing simple table listings or empty states, then we can just really keep it simple and just stick with Ruby and Hamel. Uh, and there's really no JavaScript that's involved there. Um, if we need interactivity, then we need to figure out what layer are we working with? What layer of JavaScript uh, it, does this feature exist as? Is it still jQuery? Is it a, a vanilla JavaScript or is it already a view component? And then once we decide, okay, well, maybe the component or the application can be replaced or reused and we can do it in a reusable fashion, then it makes sense to, to convert it to view. And of course, if you're managing state across components and it gets a little bit more complicated and you're dealing with uh, state across components, then it makes sense to add on UX. But a couple of things to keep in mind um, when we're working on these front-end features is to minimize the use of, of jQuery. We want to get away from it. We don't really need it as much uh, as we do anymore. Um, and so we should always try to prefer uh, vanilla JavaScript. Um, of course, one exception here is if the file is predominantly jQuery, then it may make sense just to continue using jQuery. But uh, even then, it's always preferable to just stick with uh, vanilla JavaScript so that at least there's a little bit less to convert when we need to uh, completely move it over. So examples of feature costs. I'm going to go over a couple of deliverables, uh, completed and ongoing with Manage, uh, that kind of speak to the way we have to kind of evaluate these, these deliverables and how we kind of approach them. And there's some lessons learned uh, as not, of them, not all of them are the greatest uh, examples of uh, estimating and um, breaking down. So the first one is the project list UI redesign. So we wanted to take our uh, existing um, project uh, list and give it a little bit more data, a little bit more interactivity, and also just make it look a little bit nicer. So looking at this, we know that we have this data before because we have these in our project overview. Um, we can see that we have a star control, which ex already exists. So if we look at this, we can tell that is the data there. You know, we, we, we check it, uh, make sure that it's available, and we can surface it through our Haml templates, make sure there's no backend dependency that we need to do to actually get that data. But overall, there's no new functionality that isn't present elsewhere. So, our result is that we only really need to make Haml template and CSS changes. So we don't have to convert this table to a giant view component. It's just kind of doing, along with our GitLab principles, is just keeping it simple using boring solutions. Uh, we've just made some minimal changes possible. Uh, going forward, another example is our import project status table uh, UI refresh. We wanted to give this a little bit more statefulness, give a little bit more interactivity, um, and actually give it a little bit more uh, information. And as well, you know, okay, make it look nicer. But the main thing was that we wanted to also make it more maintainable. So in this case, um, while we added statefulness and, you know, when we can tell when a project is running or when something's done and we can go to the project, um, we also realized looking at the code that uh, it was quite old and difficult to maintain. 
And so kind of summing, summarizing this all up, when we needed more interactivity uh, and we wanted to improve the maintainability of the implementation, then it made sense to convert it to Vue and Vuex. Moving forward, we had group level project templates. And this is actually kind of the example of where we currently kind of need inline JavaScript. But um, this one is, uh, we'll be shipping in 11.6 and uh, is a follow up from our instance level project templates. So, really, there's not much difference between instance level project templates and group level project templates. The main difference is that you can obviously in group templates have multiple templates that belong to a subgroup. But overall, the feature is primarily the same. Now, that's not to say that on the back end, there's still work that needs to be done because there definitely was. But on the front end side of things, uh, there was a lot of existing functionality that we could leverage. And so again, we went with a boring solution. We quite literally copied the solution from instance level project templates and added the minimal JavaScript we needed to be able to have that expand and collapse functionality. And so this is an, one final example, which is my favorite, which I won't forget at GitLab because uh, this is an example of how things can go wrong uh, and how you can estimate things or want to refactor things and uh, really just kind of have a snowball effect where uh, you have a deliverable that misses uh, cycles repeatedly. And so the concept of this was quite easy. We have this project dropdown, which allows you to see your uh, frequently visited projects. And we wanted to copy it over to the groups uh, tab and just show you the groups that you, uh, you visit the most. So this is quite easy. Uh, uh, there were no dependencies. The data was already there. And uh, my manager actually advised me to just copy and paste uh, the code from frequent projects. But I decided, uh, being new to GitLab and wanting to really uh, deliver as much value as possible to decide to consolidate all these components into one, right? Why copy the code? Why have duplicate code when we can just make it easier and have one component handle it for both? But along the way, I also decided, let's convert it to Vue. That was all good. And then I said, well, there's some statefulness involved with this. I can use the actions to retrieve the frequent projects and groups. Um, I can use some mutations and, and really get Vuex going here. Uh, and so I decided to add Vuex on top of it. And what ended up happening was a, uh, what should have been a very simple task turned into uh, something that lasted between, I think, two release cycles. So it was definitely something that uh, I learned and that really inspired me to kind of put this, this presentation together to really understand that, yeah, we really need to be pragmatic about how we uh, migrate things to Vue and how we get there. And um, also, understanding the scope of a given deliverable and, and how we really want to to approach it. But to recap in terms of feature costs and how to identify them and how to how to really approach it, uh, you know, pick the best approach that makes sense to you. Um, it's something you really need to talk with with your product manager, your UX uh, counterpart, as well as your back end and front end uh, teammates as well to figure out what data needs to be there. Uh, what, what changes need to happen, and maybe if it has to be a refactor, can it be broken down further? Is there you know, more uh, of an MVC somewhere in between? And all of that's just to figure out how we can de design your next iteration to be a step in the right direction, to get to things like Vue.js. Um, and it's, it's obviously OK to be uh, ambitious, but it's also important to, to have a gut check and be a little bit more realistic as well. So any questions? about feature costs so far. Cool. Then we will keep on going. Estimation is hard, but we can make it easier. So these are kind of the tips I, I, I wish I had known or, or kind of reminded myself repeatedly uh, when I was first starting out and that I do now when I approach any deliverable. Um, and so these are, these are ways that you can identify these feature costs and how you can identify dependencies and figure out, okay, does this, does this issue really need to be broken up more or is there something I need or is there somewhere else I have to check? So just jumping into it, we've got a front end development process, this kind of checklist of all these things that we can do when we're planning and executing the development of a front end feature. There's a link to this later on and it's quite exhaustive, I would say. 
uh, and all of the points are quite valuable, but there I kind of have a, a top, I think it's like eight or so that I really ask myself for each deliverable. And then I can dive a little bit deeper if these questions uh, really cause more questions. Um, so the first one is, what is the feature composed of? Is it primarily Ruby? Is it, uh, does it need backend support? Are there helpers for this? Is there, is there data I need to surface? Is it actually stretching into an area that maybe I need some backend support for? Um, is it primarily jQuery, vanilla JavaScript, Vue? A little bit of a mix of the all of the above. Uh, it could be very well uh, possible that what you're working on um, is a big combination of it. So it's really important to figure out what's, what's the best move to still deliver the feature, but not be caught up in converting everything to view, for example. And uh, this really leads you to think uh, whether you should consider breaking the issue down. Um, and especially for front end, it may make sense to have separate UX and back end issues. If there's data you need and you don't know how to interface with the back end or it's not available on the API. Um, if there's UX specs that you need that, um, you know, you really need the full UX spec before you can estimate the front end work involved and know that if you're working on something, for example, like uh, project overviews, do you need to worry about uh, the geo features, the project mirroring features on the enterprise side of things? Um, and that, and just going back to that, that may actually mean that uh, like these UX and backend uh, uh, ticket, uh, these issues might have to be like a release before you actually go in and, and execute on your work and, and that might be okay. but taking a look at all of this and what's involved with delivering on your, your feature uh, will at least help you identify that and makes it easier to actually make that case uh, for splitting things up and maybe scheduling things a little bit differently. Another question worth asking um, when you're breaking this down is how much interactivity is needed? Does it even need Vue.js? Um, is it a drop down? One kind of perfect example of uh, technical debt is that we uh, have four different uh, job, uh, drop-down libraries. So which library do we need to use? Um, we want to get rid of all of them. We would love to have just one that does it all for us, but certain ones solve different use cases. And I have my night mode turning on, so let me just switch that back. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, it's just trying to figure out um, how much interactivity is actually needed and determining how much JavaScript you actually have to write to achieve it. Um, what already exists that you can use? Um, what components from Bootstrap 4 and GitLab UI are available? Uh, and I'll get a little bit more into some UI resources that are available to us uh, that we want to try to utilize as much as possible, such as our design system, CSS Lab, our CSS framework, and GitLab UI, our Vue Bootstrap component library. So taking a look at what you need to deliver on and what is available to you uh, and trying to figure out how much, how little you actually need to do or, or how much, or what's, what's the diff between what's available and what you need to actually do to achieve the feature um, is, is a great question. But also one thing worth asking is if there's existing code, it doesn't make sense to migrate it to CSS Lab or GitLab UI. Um, and so getting into our tools a little bit, it's a little bit of a break between these approaches is uh, our, our tools that we have as front enders available to us. So we have pajamas, our GitLab design system with all of the components and all of the methodology and the reasoning behind our typography, our components, our things like our popovers, how we do models and things like that, which is heavily leaning on Bootstrap 4, but also with the GitLab flavor uh, kind of mixed into it. Um, we have GitLab UI, which is our view bootstrap framework, uh, which you have links here to check out our storybook uh, to actually be able to interact with the components and uh, change the parameters around that. And then we also have CSS Lab, which is our uh, CSS framework that we're slowly migrating our existing uh, CSS over to, um, to uh, hopefully kind of be our comprehensive and our single source of truth in terms of our CSS across GitLab UI and other GitLab uh, applications perhaps as well. Um, and another question to ask when you're evaluating deliverables on the front end is, is the data available uh, from the back end? And that means, can you make the right uh, can, can you write, make the right queries to surface it in the controller to expose it in the Haml templates? Or is it available on the API? Should it be available on the API? More often than not, maybe we want to have that available not only for the front end to consume, but for API users as well. 
We've, we've also got GraphQL as, uh, when we want to query for additional data, which we're st slowly starting to use as well. So these are all different questions, and this is like a big dependency, of course, with front end of, you know, is there backend data available, or do I need backend support, or do database support to really get what I need to build this feature? Um, and the big one, of course, is how does it behave in Enterprise Edition? I kind of touched on this a little bit, but you have to check how the feature differentiates between CE and EE, and this is especially important when you're getting UX specs. And uh, there may be some hidden, un uh, unconfigured options or features on the enterprise side of things that you have to really look in the code to identify things like geo or project mirroring uh, or impersonation, which you don't really, these are tucked away and you don't really use them uh, very often, but can be uh, quite important when you're redesigning or doing a page overhaul or adding new features that may conflict with these existing enterprise features. And it's also just good just to check twice, um, which is why I put, are you sure? Because it can definitely come to, to haunt you if you don't account for the different uh, feature, the feature differences between CE and EE. And then one thing you also want to uh, check out is uh, whether you need to manage state in your application. And uh, we try to manage event state within our view components, uh, but we want to avoid using event hub because at that point, your state is probably getting complex enough or you're having to manage uh, state across multiple components in a given application. And um, you, at that point, you'll want to use Vuex. Uh, and we have a lot of resources in our front end guidelines on how GitLab does Vuex. Um, and this is the last point, tests. Um, you got to check if there are any uh, and we have to account for it in unit tests, of course, but also check our functional RSpec tests see if where the existing ones are and if we had to, we, if we have to add new ones. And then of course with Vuex, there's a lot more testing involved there, making sure that our actions, mutations, getters and setters are all accounted for as well. Um, thankfully we have a Vue CLI that Philippe is working on that will make a lot of the boilerplate uh, creation a lot easier. But the main point for all of these different questions that we ask when we look at these deliverables is to figure out how we can break these issues down into as many pieces as possible. Um, this really helps us with our ability and our confidence to be able to deliver on, on things. And this is things that we've, these are things that we've accounted for and had to realize working on manage uh, because there may be dependencies we miss or hidden requirements that we didn't see at first glance. And so it's really important to try to figure out uh, and answer these questions because it will determine how heavy or how much weight your deliverable may have. And there's a link at the bottom right there to check out our development process checklist um, if you're interested, but it's also in our resources slide um, towards the end of this deck. Any questions? Cool. So we're on the tail end here, um, and I realize we're a little bit over, but I'll try to uh, hurry it up. Um, but what's next is uh, not, <laughs> it, might, it might surprise you, but we just keep shipping. We move fast and we continue shipping the minimum viable change. But along the way, we can improve our processes uh, and our workflows. But the main goal is that we just continue to move towards Vue.js, uh, and then slowly but surely bring our code to the latest standards and guidelines. It kind of opens, ah, that's right. Sorry, I thought it was at three, um, not 3.30. Thank you for the reminder. Um, but I don't think there was anything that I, I missed on that last one. Um, it's, it's really no surprise there. We just have to keep shipping, but we have to uh, just continually improve ourselves uh, when we break down deliverables and uh, try to identify these feature costs as much as possible. Um, some questions to ask ourselves too, which is kind of a little bit exci uh, exciting maybe um, for some of us is, you know, as we move away from Hamel and, 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 G and Ruby, you know, well, we need server-side rendering if we need to worry about kind of the content when we first load pages. Um, obviously, performance is a continual question on how we continue to deliver the better user experience while we have these different layers of JavaScript. And uh, one conversation that I know is kind of happening right now, I'm not really sure the current status of it, but is, you know, does GitLab can, uh, start to operate API first? And does that mean we have 
to create kind of a bigger single page application that the uh, that will be the GitLab UI and then interact with uh, GitLab as a as an API. Um, there's also other topics that we can uh, dive into, like progressive web apps, and like we're moving towards just for faster testing and, and better testing. But uh, yeah, it's just um, it's exciting. <laughs> So to recap, it's kind of hard to recap all of this. Um, and it might seem a little bit all over the place, but really it's just about our experience developing front end on the managed side of things. And some of the things that, some of the challenges we encountered with dependencies with deliverable, deliverables, how to estimate things. And, and it's gonna be increasingly important that we get these things right uh, as we start to measure throughput as we want to be more predictable and be able to do things like deliver on a majority of our, our deliverables. You know, if we want to say we want to hit all of our P1s and some of our P2s and so on, it's going to be really important to uh, really get these things right or at least get better at it because estimation and these features are never similar. So it, we, we can, estimation can be all over the place um, as I'm sure you may have encountered yourself. Uh, features can encounter a number of road bumps that will cause you to miss release cycles, but that's, a way, uh, that's okay. Um, I think, as mentioned, if we continually improve our process, uh, then we, we will over time get better at it. But if we do our due diligence of breaking down these deliverables uh, and asking those questions on how to identify these feature costs and, and trying to get these dependencies taken care of, then um, the amount of surprises can, can reduce. It's not foolproof. I think we will continue to encounter things along the way. But uh, the more effort we put into it, at least the higher level of confidence we can have. And um, here are some links to our guidelines development process. Uh, I will update this to include links to GitLab UI, CSS Lab, uh, as well as our design system. And also some uh, usernames to ping if you want to talk to the managed front-end engineers. Um, otherwise, there's their channel on Slack. And that's it. So hopefully you found that useful. Um, this, again, some of the challenges we've encountered uh, building front end, uh, a lot of us on manager quite fresh to GitLab. And so hopefully there were some useful tips or strategies that can help when you're looking at your deliverables for GitLab. But um, any questions, feedback, comments on any of the material? Yeah, I, I just want to say thank you. I, I started last Monday, so it's kind of, that was nice just to see kind of like a big picture um, kind of from the very, very beginning, you kind of started talking about the various technologies you guys have used over time and the migration mm -hmm. over time as well. That's something I just wasn't really aware of. So it's kind of interesting to see that. And mm -hmm. so yeah, just appreciate the, the info sharing for sure. For sure. Yeah, um, I would highly recommend check, checking out Jacob's presentation and that 101 slide that I put together. He goes cool. into a much, much deeper uh, dive into like, because he was um, with a lot of other front enders, they were there when they were converting from CoffeeScript to ES5 and then writing, re manually rewriting things, these things back to ES6 and so on. So uh, there's a lot of background information there, uh, which I put as a 101, 101. He happens to be my manager too, so that's kind of handy, I guess. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> cool. Any other questions? Any other feedback? Awesome. Well, thanks for tuning in uh, for those that joined live. Uh, thanks for watching for those who are watching the recording. I uh, hope you found some of the information useful and uh, hopefully it's uh, We'll, we'll continue, maybe we'll do a new one once we kind of refine the process further and, and front end continues to evolve. But uh, other than that, um, I wish you a good rest of your day. Uh, give you back 35-ish minutes and uh, see you in the next one. Cheers again, Doug. See ya. Take care.